I uh, believe from time to time, you kind of get to the end of your rope and certain things, you just think, think I, I need to do something about that. I need to fix that. I need to change that. I need to go see the doctor. Uh, I think America came to a place uh, on uh, September 11, 2001, where after we were, we were attacked for a while, we were disoriented, didn't know what to do. And, and then I think the president and others rose up and they said, well, it's time we do something about this and really change the face of America. And I think all of us from time to time get to the place where we say, I've had enough and I need to fix this. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I believe tonight we need to get that place spiritually where we say, yes, our world is falling down around us. And yes, there's all kinds of confusion politically, economically, educationally, medically, all those things are going on. And we're just kind of left in a tailspin. But somewhere along the line, you got to get your feet on the ground. Somewhere along the line, we need to understand that God is in perfect control of everything. While it seems like everything's in chaos, we serve a God that created this world that is in control. How many believe that? Say amen. He is in control. And if he's the one in control in control, and not the new world order crowd, but God's the one is the one that's in control, then you and I need to seek God because that's where we're going to find peace and that's where we're going to find power. Now tonight, uh, in our text, the prophet Hosea was preaching to the northern kingdom of Israel. And uh, historically, outwardly, at this point in, in time, the nation was enjoying a time of prosperity, a time of growth, but inwardly they were morally and spiritually corrupt. Kind of sounds like America, doesn't it? It kind of sounds like the modern church, doesn't it? You know, it seems like a, the big mega churches get real big and they got their rock and roll and everybody's just doing great, but morally they can't keep their marriages together. Morally they're corrupt. Spiritually they're corrupt. <clears throat> and the same is true for America. I'm going to get me a little water here. Same is true for America. We are bankrupt spiritually. Our nation wasn't founded that way. Our nation was founded on the book that you have in your hands tonight. And so uh, they were bankrupt. Israel had ceased to obey and follow God uh, as they were taught. And the prophet declares this uh, back in chapter four. You want to look at it. Verse one, hear the word of the Lord. By the way, revival starts with getting back to the word of God. Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel, for the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. I want you to notice that phrase, controversy. God had something against Israel. What he had against Israel was they'd walked away from the word of God. Ladies and gentlemen, anytime we walk away from God's word, anytime we lay God's word down and say, I don't need that, I'm gonna go a different way, God's got a problem with us. I think God has a controversy with this nation because this nation, listen, we know better than the way we're living. When I was a kid growing up, my mama used to say, you know better than that. My dad said, hell, you know better than that. And you know what I did? But I chose to uh, 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 rebel or, or uh, whatever, go my own way. And so uh, at this point in time, Israel had ceased to obey God. Hosea is called by God to prophesy during what many believe was Israel's, the 10 northern tribes, Israel's, final years. In this book, he preaches against the nation of God and tells them of the coming judgment of the Lord. He exposes their dishonesty, ingratitude, insincerity, idolatry, and covetousness with a stinging message intended to drive the nation back to God. It was time to seek the Lord. Uh, Hosea is a small book. You can sit down and read it in about 10, 15 minutes. And it was really a concise message <clears throat> to the people of God. And, uh, what we see in this book is God's last effort to plug the hole of a nation that was quickly going down the drain. Now, ladies and gentlemen, tonight, America cannot sustain itself in the moral direction it's heading. I don't need to tell you that. I know you know that. Uh, families and, 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 and civility as we know it will cease to exist if somebody somewhere doesn't plug the hole of destruction in our nation. And that was the man of God's job. Hosea was called upon to do that. Sadly, in just a few years after the close of this book, Israel was attacked by the Assyrian Empire, carried off into captivity. They refused to listen to the pleas of God. God found nobody who would say, enough is enough. God found nobody that would say, it's time to seek the Lord. 
Sometimes we think that our nation can never be invaded. Sometimes we act like that America can never be overthrown. I know there's difference of opinion in this, and I don't mean to rock your boat tonight, but I don't know you're going to find too many places where America is necessarily mentioned in prophecy. I don't know what's going to happen to America, but I know what can happen to America. We could have revival. I know that God is possible. And even if this, this nation continues on the same trajectory, the church of the living God still needs to seek a revival. I want to say several things tonight. I'll get to it in just a moment. But uh, these folks refuse to listen to the pleas of God. And uh, today, Christianity in America is in the same shape. I, I don't need to tell you that, that morally we're bankrupt. We're losing churches to liberalism, left and right. This is a rare church. I know you know that. That's what makes it so special. That's what makes it so exciting to come to. Divorce rate is the same for the church as it is in the world. That's strange to me. Our morals or lack of them are basically like the world's with more Christians agreeing with the new woke agenda. And it's so sad. Church attendance is at an all-time low in America. And just in case you didn't know this, church attendance in churches all over, every denomination was spiraling down. But after COVID hit and churches shut down across this nation, it's had a hard time getting back up on its feet. Everybody's in the same boat, folks. I mean, something happened the last three years that's caused things to escalate. And uh, I tell you what I like to see. I don't like to see revival get on fire and escalate. That's what I like to see. Uh, so, so this all-time low, there's, there's a little difference between a church service and a Broadway show. Uh, few preach on sin any longer. Uh, churches have pretty much done away with Sunday school and Bible preaching, and we've raised a generation uh, that has very little a knowledge of God. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, the apostle calls it ear-tickling ear preaching. They want preaching uh, that uh, pleases the ear. Sometimes preaching doesn't please the ear. Uh, sometimes preach, preachers are like somebody swatting bumblebees or wasps after them, uh, as uh, President Abraham Lincoln said. He said, I like to see a preacher, a man of God on fire. He said, I like to see a preacher that acts like he's, he's sorting uh, bees. As I'm not going to sort no bees, that's for sure, tonight. But uh, uh, we seems like we've lost the fire in our pulpits. And today, Christians have trouble being successful with even the basics of the Christian life. My question tonight is this. Will anyone in our Bible-believing churches stand up and say, enough's enough. It's time to seek the Lord. When he uses the phrase time, the word time here, he said it's time. Now's the time. He's talking about a specific moment. Now is a day. Now is a time to seek the Lord. And uh, it's high time that we do that. I want you to know that uh, somebody needs to find out what God thinks. I want to know what God thinks about me and my ministry. I want to know what he, his will is for our church. I want uh, his power on my life, his favor on what I do. I believe the Bible tells us, without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a re rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. God wants to do something to the person. He wants to do something for the person who seeks him. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 29, Moses told the people of God, But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him, if thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. It's time to seek the Lord. You say, Pastor, what is this seeking the Lord? I want you to jot down three things tonight. I'm going to take all three things from this verse right here, verse number 12. To seek the Lord means it is a call to righteousness. It is a call to righteousness. He says, so to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy. He is using agricultural terms here. He says, if you're going to get the former uh, latter rain, if you're going to get that fresh rain, if you're going to see the crop of your spiritual life grow, you're going to have to, uh, to, to accept a call to righteousness. So to yourselves, 
That's what you're to do. So to yourselves, those seeds of righteousness. Here the preacher extends a call to individuals to get back to righteous living. If you have a Bible and you've got a Bible preacher in this church, you do. He tells you what the Bible says is right and what the Bible says is wrong. He doesn't tell you what Pastor Fong says is right or wrong. He tells you what God says is right or wrong. And uh, this is a Bible preaching church trying to call people back to righteous living. You sow more immoral living, you reap the evil of it. You sow unspiritual pagan living, you reap the godless society that it produces. However, if you sow righteousness, you reap in mercy. If America will sow in godliness throughout this land, we would reap a nation that has the mercy of God shown upon us. And there's nothing America needs more now than mercy, the mercy of Almighty God. I, I watch the news sometimes. I step back and I, and I mean this literally. I don't say this as slang. I want to say just God help us. What, where are we going? What are we thinking? And ladies and gentlemen, tonight we need the mercy of God. And the mercy of God comes when righteousness is sown in our lives. I mean, the church that sows righteousness will reap mercy. The family that sows righteousness will reap mercy. A Christian that sows in righteousness will reap mercy. It's a call to honesty and purity and holy living. And the Bible still says, we reap what we sow. You don't sow uh, corn, expect to get beans. You don't sow immorality and expect to get morality. You can name the sin in your life, whatever it is that Satan has tempted you in. And can I say that is a call for you to get that right. Number one is a call to righteousness. Number two, it is a call to repentance. It is a call to repentance. He says, uh, break up your fallow ground for it is time to seek the Lord. Get this thing turned around. The breaking up of fallow ground. The farmer that leaves his ground untilled and unplowed, that's the breaking up of the fallow ground, is not intending to sow anything. He will have no crop. Either he is too lazy to work the ground, or he has all that he needs, and he has no desire to profit anymore. And uh, there is a, a farmer that owns, owns land and a farm with acreage that is to be planted, and does, he does not plant it, it does not produce. And listen to this. When that farm and that land does not produce, then people go without the food or whatever they need that doesn't have land. And when churches choose not to get right with God so they have the power of God, they fail to produce in an area like San Leandro that the people, the people around needs this church to have their ground broken up. That needs to be, it needs to be sown and it needs to be able to produce in this area. And thank God it is. Thank God it is. Uh, and, and that's where most Baptists are today. I, I do not know if it's so much that Baptists are lazy as it is the fact that we just don't need anything from God. We have no desire to see any, incre any increase on what the church has done in the past. We've lost our zeal, our, our desire. And uh, we, if not careful, we'll get in an apathetic position where we just have church as usual. Don't ever get to the place as a church. This is a lively place. Don't ever get to the place as a church where you just want to have same old, same old, week after week after week. When you get that place, somebody somewhere say, hey, hey, enough's enough. It's time we seek the Lord. It's time we get back to God. It's time we make things right with God. When you repent of this, the farmer that doesn't plow his ground needs to repent. And that's what God told the church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, verse 4. Nevertheless, he said, I have someone against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. Uh, when I was a younger man, my, my grandfather on my mom's side had a farm about 250 acres. It was what they call a hill farm. Everything's so flat out here, but it was a hill farm. And uh, then my dad had a farm. And uh, there were there was land that we had to plant our crops in. We had cattle and different things as well. But fallow ground 
uh, and I've sat on a tractor many hours, drop that bottom plow and plow up at the 12 inch, two 12 inch plows and plow the land. But fallow ground was, you had new ground and you had fallow ground. New ground was whenever you set the plow in and the ground had never been turned. It had never been disc or harrowed, it had never been planted. Fallow ground was ground that had already been plowed, but it was laying fallow and it needed to be turned over just a little bit and replanted. What the prophet is saying here is this. Uh, fallow ground is ground that's known to be planted. It has been planted, but it's not being planted. And that's what he's saying about the local church, if I could make a, make a contrast here. Churches that have known, that have been planted in the area, why are they planted? Pastor told me about your church planting emphasis, what you're trying to get going in this area. I think that is a tremendous idea. I think it's a biblical model. But can I say, why do that? Why do you plant a, chance, a church in this section? Why? It is a sowing. It is a sowing in an area that you've turned up by knocking on doors, telling folks about Christ. By the way, that's what a local church should do. And whenever farmers got away from that, uh, people, people suffered. And when churches get away from breaking up that fallow ground that they know should be planted, uh, people suffer all around us. Somehow, we get this idea that, that, yes, the nation and the church seems to be going down the tubes backwards, but and they, people will say, well, what have I done? Is that, is that my fault? Well, I don't know. Is it? Have you tried to win anybody to Christ lately? What do you do? What's your work here in the church? And do you tithe? And, and are you faithful to God's house? And do you sing if you're talented in that way? Uh, do you use your gift for the Lord? Uh, do you give to missions or work in missions? Are you helping this church grow? Everybody has a place to help this church grow. One, one good way to stay in perpetual revival is find a place somewhere and get busy. I don't care if it's ushering, singing in the choir, uh, handing out bulletins. I don't care what it is, picking up chairs. I tell you what, we had a fire in our church. It wasn't a revival fire. Our church literally caught on fire. And uh, it's just back in August. And uh, we had to move up to our gymnasium. I remember that night we were coming into church. And uh, church started at 630. I got out of my, my truck about 10 after 6. And I, I smelled smoke. And I thought, well, I thought uh, maybe somebody's barbecuing out. But it didn't smell like barbecue. It smelled like something was on fire. And so I walked in, our choir was finishing up choir practice. I looked around, people were coughing. And I looked up in the ceilings where these lights are and I saw smoke laying up there. And I thought, well, something's not right here. And I thought, well, maybe the air conditions had pulled something in out of the outside or whatever. We, the assistant fire chief was a member of our church. He was coming about that time. I said, chief, what do you think? And he said, well, let's look around. So we looked, long story short, the church was on fire. Uh, immediately we had to pull the fire alarm run everybody up the gymnasium. We had to set out chairs. I'll never forget this, set out chairs everywhere. And we had church that night. We had a sweet service. But then for many months, we set up chairs and picked them up and set up chairs and picked them up and set up chairs. We, were so, we are so sick of setting up chairs and picking them up that we moved back in the auditorium. We have, we have no carpet. All the paint's not even done. Everything's not finished. We are baptizing in a cattle watering trough because that's not complete yet. All because we got tired of setting up chairs and taking them down. I'm just saying this. I don't care if you just set up chairs and take them down. I don't care. So when you knock on doors, everybody ought to have a place in church. And one way to stay in perpetual, perpetual revival is get you a place to serve God. It keeps you right with God. It keeps you accountable to God. And, uh, you know, do you pray? Do you pray for your pastor? I mean, there ought to be a group of men and a group of ladies that pray for the power of God on your pastor, on his dear wife, and that God would protect his family, that God would give him wisdom, that God would give him a vision, that God would give him power. I so enjoyed getting with a few men right before church and, and pastor praying that God would help me as I preach because I need God's help. I'm a man of like passion, just like everybody else. Without the help of God, we get nothing tonight. Without the word of God, we get no truth. And we just need to repent of all that. We want the world to be saved. But when, the last, when was the last time as a Christian you repented of something? You see, this starts with the family of God. Repentance is, is not an unusual word in the Bible. I don't want you to get it confused. And by the way, it's used a lot in the Old Testament. 
It's used in the New Testament a lot concerning Israel, that they needed to get the thing turned around. They knew better. And you kind of just say it's a change of direction. And if you're going the wrong direction right now, you need to get it turned around. You say, Pastor, I'm not living any type of open sin. I get that. I understand that. And it doesn't, just because you're not living open sin does not mean you don't need revival. Where are you at in your walk with God? You know, I, I thought about uh, when was the last time you felt the Spirit of God tug at your heart? And uh, when was the last time you knelt at an old-fashioned altar and, and, and you told God yes and whatever it is that uh, He wanted you to do? You see, God has given each of us a life to live, and if we live it uh, the way we want it, then we're not going to have the blessings and favor of God. So we need to take that fallow ground, put the, put the, 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 the uh, harrow in or the plow in deep, and turn that soil over and get in there and plant that thing and uh, let God uh, bless it and till it. And, and uh, I'm just saying, don't leave your life unplowed, unchallenged, unmotivated, unmoved. We will not enjoy the latter rain or the rain of righteousness if we don't keep ourselves fired up somewhere. Stirred up. Much of my life, I'm a pastor. As the pastor said just a moment ago, preachers need preaching. And I'll get some, some messages on my uh, computer, download them. I'll put preaching in as I go down the road in my, in my truck. And I, I, just, I, just, I just need preaching from time to time. And I'm going to tell you why. If the preacher cannot get stirred up, we cannot see our churches stirred up. May God help us with that. Break up our fallow ground. We need uh, not only repentance, but we need uh, a call. This is not just a, a call to repentance and a call to righteousness, but it is a call to revival. Number three, a call to revival. The Bible says, till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 18 says, The wicked worketh a deceitful work, but to him that soweth righteousness shall be a sure, sure reward. I don't know how it is in Northern California, but in Southern California, it's been dry for a long time. Is it like that up here, Pastor? It's been dry for a long time. Um, and drought and all that. And I understand you all have just come through brutal rains the past several months. And I know you're thankful for, for the rain, but it was brutal out here for a while. But um, when I was a boy growing up in West Virginia, then I moved to Tennessee, you say, how did you get from West Virginia to, to Tennessee? Well, I speak hillbilly if you haven't figured it out yet. There's only three states I could, I could preach in, West Virginia, Kentucky, or Tennessee. I did not want to go to Kentucky. So uh, when I was a boy growing up, I can remember being, being outdoors playing. And all of a sudden, a thunderstorm come up, and that rain came down. Now, I don't know how it is in California, but where I live, when a fresh fallen rain comes, I'm not talking about the monsoons that never stop, but whenever you had a real pretty day, a hot day, and a fresh rain falls, how many, how many you say, say it's just, it just smells good. It just sounds it's like God washed the earth. It's just clean, a clean smell. And kind of say that that's what God wants to do with you. God wants us to feel his freshness. When revival breaks out, in your heart or in a church, I'm just telling you, you're going to know it. Pastor and I was, uh, we were talking today uh, over a late lunch, and we were talking about a particular meeting in another church, and, and uh, just I've been to that meeting before. I was not in the same meeting he was in, but it just seemed like how just heaven came down and how people just began to respond at the altar, and, and what, a, what a wonderful, wonderful time it is. And I like to tell you that We've had, we've had some all-out revivals in our ministry. We try to stay uh, in, in revival and keep people fired up. But I, I would just tell you, there are times at Franklin River Baptist Church that it just gets special. It's just like a, a fresh fallen rain refreshes and purifies and smells clean. Uh, in history, revival history, in Ulster, England, revival of the 1920s broke out in a shipyard as itinerant preachers would preach to all the iron workers there and steel workers. And uh, it is told that in the Ulster revival that workers repented and brought back so many stolen tools that new sheds had to be built, built to house all the recovered property. 
I, I'm just saying revival results in repentance and re repentance results in restitution and restitution results in a clean heart and revival. Billy Sunday, the American evangelist of the late 1800s, early 1900s, when he preached would shut down beer joints. His wife, Ma Sunday, would get up on the liquor and whiskey wagons and take a big broad axe and hit the side of those wooden, uh, wooden barrels of whiskey. And uh, Billy Sunday would stand there as the whiskey would run out of those barrels and he'd preach the message, get on the water wagon, get off the devil's wagon, get on the water wagon. And the history says in Billy Sunday's meetings that taverns and beer joints were shut down and laws were instituted in many cities against the open sale of liquor. I live in a city that just a few short years before I moved to Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and I came in 99, just a few short years, it was a dry city preacher. And a dry city was a city where there was no alcohol. Now there's alcohol places on just about every corner. And America is drunken on the spirits of the devil. I'm just saying, there was a day, you talk about the impossible. You're saying right now, preacher, America can never get there. And America may never get there. But the church of the living God don't need to have anything to do with some of the stuff that's being used out there. Revivals. One day, a lady walked up to Billy Sunday. She said, Mr. Sunday, why do you keep having revivals when you know they don't last? To which Moody replied to the lady, why do you keep taking baths, woman, when you know they don't last either? <laughs> he was like that. He was like that. Revivals fill churches with new converts, restore broken relationships. And it could be even right now, right now for someone here tonight, God is speaking to your heart about a broken relationship that you've had with another person, another brother and sister in Christ, another family member, and it's going to have to be dealt with in your life. I'm not telling you how to deal with that. I'm just telling you that if you're not careful, that will block. Can I just stop and say this, and I'm chasing rabbits here right now, and forgive me. But I wish that you would see the importance of keeping your marriage right and keeping your marriage fresh. All marriages have fusses and dust-ups. We don't want to call them arguments or fights. We just say, well, we just had a little misunderstanding. <laughs> yeah, you had all-out dogfight. That's what you had. <laughs> but uh, everybody has them. And, uh, but can I say that we ought to uh, not let the sun go down on our wrath, be angry and sin not. And there's a line you can cross. And, and how, how in the world can you come to the, to the house of God on Sunday morning after there's been some blow-up and get anything from God. May God help you if you can. I'm just saying all these things are the recipe, or you might say the ingredients for revival. Keeping our sin on short accounts, repentance and walking away from those things. Keeping relationships uh, pure and, and holy and right. Let me see if I can sum this all up for you tonight. There is a plowing. There is a planting. And there is precipitation or a rain. There is a plowing. There is a plant. No sense in plowing if you're not going to plant. There is a plowing. You say that righteous seed. And then there is a precipitation. There is a rain to fall. A couple of places in Scripture, the Bible talks about the former and latter rain. Most theologians believe that talks about revival. Dr. John R. Rice was the editor of the Sword Lord. He was the founder of it for many years. He's been in heaven for several years now. But he wrote several books on revival. He was himself a revivalist and evangelist. Spoke to crowds. They'd build big uh, um, tabernacles. He would speak to, speak to crowds of thousands. He believed that America could see revival. He died believing that America could see revival. And I've, I've watched this as a pastor now in the culture we're living in today. And I'm looking around and thought, what in the world? I mean, I think churches maybe ought to just kind of back up and hold their own. But that is such wrong thinking. That's backward thinking. Because we serve a God that can do the impossible. Let me just put it to you like this. Let me lay it all out to you. You don't know this because you're living inside the box. 
But you are in a church that people where I live would say it's impossible. I'm going to go home and tell them. I'll probably be a, a, a little broad with us. I almost say place was packed out in there on Monday night. But a great crowd. And what God has allowed you to do to this point, people on my side of America would say, no way. They would be scared to death to knock on doors in your community. <laughs> they would. And uh, I tell them about this church all the time. Pastor, I, I talk about you all the time. In a nice way, not a bad way. I talk about you. <laughs> and and uh, here's my point. My point is, if God can get you to the place you're at now, where can he go from here? We just need revival. You know, your, your pastor... We built buildings that we're about the same age. We are the same age. I think you're older than me. I just want to bring that out. And, uh, but uh, but uh, we built buildings at the same time. I think about four or five, four, about four years ago, you're building a building. Both of us was borrowing millions of dollars. He went crazy. I went crazy. He called me and said, Brother Norris, how you doing? I said, how you doing? We're doing okay. We're making it. We, uh, we, 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 anytime you go through a building program, uh, it's, it's tough as a pastor but you got that thing up. I was in it today. It's beautiful. And you, you're sitting here. I asked, uh, uh, Quan picked me up today. And I said, how many places you got to park here? He said, 150. I thought, well, how in the world? We got 500 parking spots where we're at. And I thought, how do you do that? He said, well, we got a little overflow over here. We have two services. God works it all out. Can I say, God bless you. God bless you. You're doing the impossible now. And don't let things waver. Uh, get engaged again, get revived again, get stirred up and watch God just do it again. Just do it again. Just go at it again. I'm just saying it's time to seek the Lord right now. How can the church in America lead a sinner uh, to Christ that has not already been fired up himself? You know, somebody said this, you will not seek, uh, you'll not seek, the, uh, seek and save the lost if you're not already seeking the Lord. You'll not seek to save the lost if you're not already seeking the Lord. I'm just saying right now, right now, I don't know what it is. Maybe you stopped reading your Bible. You need to start again. Break up that fallow ground. You know you should do it. It's time to get right. You say, I've been wanting to. I started uh, January 1st, preacher. And uh, man, I quit two weeks ago. Well, start back. Start back. Somebody needs to say, enough's enough time to seek the Lord. Maybe you stop praying. Maybe your prayers are fervent and hot and on fire and you stop. You need to start that back in. Get you a prayer journal. Get you a list and go to praying again. Maybe you were faithful Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Sunday school, and, but now you're just kind of wavering. Start it back. Maybe you're witnessing, carrying gospel tracts and, and you kind of, uh, kind of wavered in that. Start it back. Maybe uh, holy living has, and worldliness has drifted into your life. And uh, uh, maybe singing, uh, you had a heart full of song, but now that's stopped. Maybe you're just become a, an unkind person that wants to run people off the road all the time. I, uh, America's gone crazy. Everybody's mad. I mean, you know, on social media, they like to post these pictures of people getting in fights and all that stuff. That's scaring me to death. Just stop, quit it, you know. Everyone wants to scream at the person that's checking them out. Maybe you've lost your kindness. Get it back. I'm just saying right now, it's time to seek the Lord. Moses got in trouble several times in his life. And he got to the place where he said, I just need to seek God. One time he told God, he said, I just want to see you. I'm paraphrasing now. Nobody's seen God and lived. I think Moses got to the place. He said, Lord, I've heard you talk. I've, I've, I've written things down. I, I, I've, I've watched you as you guided us with a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of a cloud by the day. And I've watched you drop manna out of heaven. I've watched all that. And, but Lord, if I could just see you, if I could just see you. And God said, only person in the Bible got this. He said, tell you what. He said, I want you to go to a special spot. And he said, when you're in that special spot I, in the cleft of the rock, I'm going to cover you with my hand and I'm going to walk by and you're going to get to see my Shekinah glory. You're going to see the, the back train of all of my glory. And the Bible says that he sought the Lord. He got that special spot. When he got that special spot, God came by and he was able to so much, so much glory he was able to see. When he came down from that place, his face did shine. People could tell he'd been with God. David got himself in a mess one time. 
got away from God. And he uh, had to say one time, he says, where is the linen ephod? The linen ephod was that place, that the, that, that, that uh, garment part that the priests would wear, that sometimes they would wear that, and it was used to, to call upon God and to, and to find out what God was supposed to do. Someday they, sometimes the priest would come in with the linen ephod, and, uh, and, then, and, then the, and the king would say, do we go up to war? Do we not go, go up to war? And the guidance of God was there. One day David said, bring thither the linen ephod. He said, I need to find the mind of God. What was he saying? I need to seek the Lord. Moses saying, I need to seek the Lord. And then I think about Elijah who ran uh, from uh, wicked Jezebel. Anybody named Jezebel, you ought to run from him. I, and uh, he, he got to the place there, the cave in Horb, and he thought he was the only person left. God said, get up, get up. He said, I've got 5,000 that's never bowed their knee to Baal, and you just get back up and get back at it. You say, what happened? He sought the Lord. He was down, and he sought the Lord. Elijah, uh, as he uh, crossed over, Elisha, as he crossed over, he took his garment off. He smote that thing, and uh, Elisha came back, and he said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? Ladies and gentlemen, we need some Elishas. Another generation picks up the power of God of the man of God and just says, I'm going to seek the Lord. I'm just saying it's time to seek the Lord. I don't know what you need to do in your life. I don't know where you have fallen back somewhat. It may be just in some simple discipline. But can I challenge you tonight? Get back to righteous living. Get back to breaking up that ground and let God tenderize you. Get back to the place where you, you get out of your prayer closet and you close your Bible. It just, it just smells like a fresh fallen rain. It's just like you, you just feel like God is close. 